My name is Sinead O'Sullivan. I am a space engineer, and as of recently, I am an interplanetary economist. Um, it's a pretty absurd title, so hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll have a little idea about what I actually do. But today, I want to start by talking about or looking at a headline that I came across in 2015, Galactic Gold Rush. Asteroid mining is to start this summer. I used to work on an asteroid uh, mining project at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. And at the time when I read this, I was an MBA student at Harvard Business School, so you can only imagine how excited I got about gold rushes. <laughs> uh, forget private equity or hedge funds or investment banking, I was going to make dollar because this article and many of the other articles published on this topic promised to make the first investors in asteroid mining trillionaires. <laughs> to put this into context, the world's richest man <laughs> who lived in Timbuktu called Mansu Musa was worth a quarter of a trillion dollars in the 1300s. So was I, or could anyone in this room, triple that by asteroid mining? Well, we're going to find out by playing who wants to be a trillionaire. <laughs> and since it's after lunch, I'm going to ask for participation to wake everyone up. And in true Harvard style, I'm going to be cold calling. So question one, of the 750 asteroids identified, how many are close enough to Earth to actually try to mine? Paula. Um, nope. Of the 17,000 <laughs> asteroids that are close to Earth, how many are approximated to actually contain anything worth trying to get? Kurt. Uh, nope. Of the, six, <laughs> of the 680 asteroids that are close to Earth, how many are a kilometer in diameter? contain more than 10 parts per million of metal and have a velocity relative to the speed of the Earth of less than 4.5 kilometers per second. Sue? Don't know. <laughs> That's the most sensible answer I've heard yet. Don't know. This is a needle in a haystack. Nobody knows the answer to this question. Lastly, eventually you find the needle in the haystack. Is it economically viable to obtain a commodity somewhere where it's super expensive to get it? and sell it somewhere where its magnitude's cheaper. <laughs> Sam? I'll take any of them. OK, good. Finally, this is starting to make sense for some of us, but not for everyone. The company that these articles were written about raised $50 million venture capital funding, and a ton of arguably very intelligent people were surrounding it. Neil deGrasse Tyson knows something about space, and these guys know something about money. So how did they get this so wrong? <laughs> yeah, this was a failed investment. Um, basically, investors are placing very large bets on where they see the future of interplanetary existence. So since the year 2000, cumulative space investment in this space, um, including debt financing, is reaching nearly 19 to 20 billion dollars. It's not just investors. Governments are playing too. In 2016, the Luxembourg government established the Space Resource Initiative, earmarking $230 million of its national space budget to asteroid mining. Now, I would be shocked if anybody in this room could place Luxembourg on an unmarked map. <laughs> Never mind knows that they're <laughs> giving a quarter of a billion dollars to asteroid mining. This is absolutely absurd, or at least I thought so. So the question that is on my mind, and the question that I want everybody to think about is, how do we actually place economic value on a system whose economy does not exist? So to do this, we're going to go through a couple of examples. And we're going to move away from, inter I guess, asteroid mining and start thinking about humans as an interplanetary species. So we're all on Mars. Welcome. <laughs> and I walk into a shop. I'm pre feeling pretty thirsty, so I go to buy a bottle of water. The clerk tells me the price of the water. I get out some cash and go to pay. Now, this is a seemingly very simple scenario. We engage in this multiple times a day, I'm sure. Um, but it's a very useful scenario to think about how complex our economy actually is and how it has taken thousands of years to evolve to get to this stage. So we have the marketplace. Who has opened a shop on Mars? Cindy, is this your shop? <laughs> is it? <laughs> is it for profit? Who are your customers? Okay, yeah. 
good, okay, this is Harvard Business School, good. Um, you've got the goods, the water, how did you get your, who, where did you buy or import this water from? I have to get from sort of sources that are cheaper. <laughs> yes, <laughs> also good. And what, how much, okay, so the value of the water, the price, how much are you selling your water for on Mars? I have to think about like a double, triple because, you know. Double, triple, okay, remember that, double or triple, okay, we'll get back to that. Uh, we're gonna look at another scenario, if anyone reads science fiction, this may seem more familiar. I, okay, we're all back on Mars, but I am in the colony, and I am going to the resources chamber to collect water, to replenish the life support system so that we can all keep digging and working and building and colonizing. So the questions are a little bit different. So we've still got the marketplace, but it's not a shop. It's a shared resource pool. Who is it controlled by? We're not too sure. Uh, we've still got the goods, which is water, but it's, you know, it's not a bottle of water. It's this big tank, and we have to allocate it to different people over different times. And we've got the value. What is the value of water, and how do we allocate this value towards different people? And so example one and example two pertain to two very different opposing economic theories, namely, uh, on one hand, you've got communism, and on the other hand, you've got capitalism. So the ins and outs of these two theories have been talked about for long before I was born, so I'm not going to talk about it now. But the, what, the one thing I do want to talk about here is that both communism, capitalism, and absolutely everything in between cannot be created out of nothing. So when you think about your, your new colony or your civilization on Mars, which of these are you going to implement and how? There is no way to start these from scratch. And so how do we think about a single regime that can fit or govern Mars? Is there anything on Earth that we can look at to try to help us? Well, yes. <laughs> so economists and anthropologists believe that all economies have started from a traditional economy. So we have traditional family cultural uh, values centering around communities. You've got hunting and gathering uh, when it comes to production, and instead of ex formal exchanges, you've got bartering across informal exchanges. So we believe that a traditional economy will eventually turn into a market commander mixed economy over time, which is perfect. This is exactly what we want on Mars, so good. Okay, so we're back on Mars, great. We've landed, we're building, we're colonizing. We've created this informal exchange, and over time we're gonna create this currency-based exchange. Thereafter, we're going to start to implement some sort of communist, capitalist, or whatever we want as per local economic and political aspirations. So this seems relatively simple. Except, and here is the caveat, economists have only ever looked at successful formation of markets where there has been an abundance of useful resources to begin with to start trading. If you look at Antarctica, you may wonder why there's no booming local, local economy. <laughs> and it's because ice is not that useful, although you can turn ice into water, so it's inherently more useful than the rocks on Mars. Rocks cannot be traded for rocks on Mars because they have zero intrinsic value. So, Cindy, we're gonna get back to pricing your water on Mars. <laughs> Somebody told me earlier that every presentation has to have an equation, so here it is. Um, <laughs> price equals cost plus margin. Um, so the cost of water on Mars, how are we going to start thinking about this? Well, if anyone thinks that their water bill is too high at the minute, stop listening. Um, <laughs> this is going to blow your mind. So it costs $45,000 to get one kilogram of payload from Earth's surface to Mars surface using SpaceX. If we assume that there's 0.42 liters per kilogram um, and that humans need two to five uh, liters of water a day, so let's split the difference and call that three. We're sitting at $320,000 per person per day for drinking water. Wow, yeah. Then if you think about the value of water, well, we could say that it's infinitely high because guess what? If we don't have it, we die. So we know that water on Mars is not actually, Cindy, two to three times, but a lot more expensive. <laughs> But we also know that there's nothing on Mars that can be bartered with or traded for this. So how do we start the economy in the first place? And this for me is the most interesting question when we start thinking about emerging or frontier economies. So since we know that the economy is not gonna, or that the water on Mars is not gonna be paid for by Martians, it's gonna have to be paid for on Earth. So who on Earth is gonna pay 
into this water. And this is where it gets complicated, nobody knows. NASA and SpaceX both tell you in 10 years time we're gonna have people living on Mars. Technologically, I do believe that. I used to work for NASA and all of my friends who work there are super smart. But feasibility for economic sense, I have never seen anything that shows me that $320,000 per person per day is gonna be paid for. Getting back to the original point, or the original question, how is it that we place economic value on systems whose economies do not currently exist? This is the crux of interplanetary economics, and as an economist, it's something that I think about a lot. But it's not important only for interplanetary existence. When I start thinking about things such as quantum computing and pharmaceutical pricing, these are industries that are coming face to face with frontier technologies that are creating step function changes in terms of the, the services they're selling, the goods they're creating, and the pricing models that they're starting to use. So hopefully in the breakout session, we can start thinking and talking about different uh, industries and technologies that are creating this frontier between what we currently know and the step function for where we're going. Thank you. Thank you.